not of works. Nothing we can do to earn it. But when we're saved, we labor to grow. He's talking to a church that was birthed under great adversity. And these believers only had a few weeks to really get down and get serious about their faith before Paul and Ty, uh, Timothy and Silas were taken away to the next place because of persecution. And they had to study and to grow to mature themselves in faith. We live in a generation of spiritually immature Christians. Number two, look at the word labor of love. And then he uses the word patience. Love and patience are not something that comes easy to people. Oh, I love, you, you say the word love like you say I love french fries. Love, remember we talked about this a few weeks ago, charity, the Bible definition of love, charity has an action to it. We say I love something, uh, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love french fries. Do you love because you say you love or do you love because you demonstrate that love? Labor of love. Love is a demonstration. Love is a choice. Love is a decision. Marriages that last, they don't live on love, the emotion. They live on love, the action. I'm going to show you. I love you. I'm going to demonstrate. I'm going to forbear. I'm going to be patient. Patience is there something that comes natural. How do you know? I live in snowbird country. I drive in snowbird country. I try to go from A to B in snowbird country. And I don't do well in the matter of patience. And I, I, I get frustrated and every now and then I, I use the thing in my steering wheel called a horn and I say things like, get off the road till afternoon. Come out between noon and three o'clock. That's the only time you should be out. I just talk, I talk to a lot of cars when I go by. Get off the road. Patience. Patience with our spouse. Patience with our children. Patience with each other. This is effort. Oh, we want to say kumbaya. We want to sing kumbaya and have a little campfire and everybody get along. If you're going to get along, you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to be forgiving, forbearing. Amen. You're, going to have to, you're going to have to take some hurt. Amen. You're going to have to use forgiveness. Amen. Churches, listen, the Bible says that we, we are to keep peace. Is that what the Bible says? No, the Bible says we're to make peace. Peace is not natural. You have to make something. You don't keep peace. You make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. Peace isn't natural. You got this many bodies, this many personalities. You got some Yankees. You got some Southerners. You got some foreigners. You got, you got a bunch of different backgrounds and put them all in one pot. Everybody's just going to get along. You're foolish to think that. But we can get along if we work at it. Work of patience. Work of love. Labor at that. So there's an effort to have a good church. You ever been, in, uh, I'm from the South, you ever been down the road, and uh, I, I was in Greenville County the other day in Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, uh, church, 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 literally as I drove down the road, church, 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 and this one is harmony and unity and peace, and I, I'm going to guarantee you that harmony is a split off unity, which is a split off peace. And, and, and they, they choose names. We want to be at peace. I'm going to tell you how to be at peace. You don't split a church. You forgive one another. You forbear one another. You work through grievances. You practice church restoration where you say, hey, did you mean to say that? Oh, no. Okay, you're forgiven. We're moving on. Go forward. You don't let things stir up and, and fester up and then blow up. So it's an effort. It's an effort. Your own family, your marriage is going to last. It's going to take work. It's going to take effort. Effort with your children. Effort with those you love. So there's great effort in a church to have the right kind of church. But number two, the election of a church. Knowing, brother, verse four is very simple. Knowing, brother, your election before God. Knowing, brother, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now, don't read something in there that's not in there. 
Don't read something in there that's not there. He's not saying one word about some people have been elected to be saved and some people have been elected to be lost. That's not at all what he's talking about there. What he's talking about there is there is an evidence of their election. There is an evidence of their salvation. And he says this, God is showing them that they are loved or beloved. He chose them. It makes sense. If I love you, I choose you. For God so loved the world. God loves, therefore he chooses. The phrase beloved of God, we see that in verse number four. The phrase beloved of God is a phrase that Jews would apply to a supremely great man like a Moses or a Solomon or, or to the nation of Israel itself. And it's the greatest privilege of the greatest men of God's chosen people to be expelled extended this great honor to be beloved of God and what he's saying is you're not Moses you're not Solomon you're just a bunch of Gentiles unworthy Gentiles but God loves you like he loves those men and then he explains it why was Paul so confident in their election and their salvation he saw the signs that these Thessalonians were the elect or the saved of God. Spurgeon said this in a sermon years ago. He said this, the signs of their election are as follows. The word of God coming home with power, uh, not in word only, but in, uh, not, not in word only, but also in power. It's there in verse number five. Not in word only, but also in power. And you receive the gospel. The word for the gospel is that good news, that dynamite of the gospel, that explosive transforming power. When somebody passes from death unto life, when they turn from their sin. And by the way, there's a great picture of that down later where it says how you turn from idols to serve the living and true God. When you get saved and God radically changes in your life there is evidence of salvation there that is powerful to see and he said you've received God's word with much assurance with much assurance man there's confidence in what God has done and and because you've seen the word of God and you've experienced the power of God with the assurance of God watch this you became followers of us and of the Lord. You became followers of us. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And of the Lord. So your, your life changed because instead of following your plan or your uh, friends or your whatever, you're now following us as we follow the Lord. There's been a changed life. And then he said this. This is my favorite part. He says, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. You've gone from suffering under the weight of sin to enjoying the blessings of the Spirit of God. A changed life, a saved life, transformed life. I thought I was chasing joy. I thought I was chasing the good life. Man, when I was running from the Lord and running with the wrong crowd and, and living the life I was living, I thought I was living it up, uh, having a high life and a big time. Man, I had no idea uh, that if I would give my life to the Lord and allow the Lord to transform me and allow the Lord to use me, uh, this world that I thought was so good, I would see it so clearly. The, the, the joy that I had was temporary. It was just a moment of pleasure then gave way to a season of pain. Uh, this is, is just some, some of the best living and some of the most joyful spirit and, and the attitude because I'm not looking for a thing or, or somebody next or something next. I found the source of all joy and there's a difference between a man who's living for himself and a man who's living for the Lord. There is internal joy, not external. We live in a place where everybody's trying to find the big thing. Get to the beach, get to Disney, get to wherever. Go, go, do, do. Listen, you don't need any of that when you know the Lord. Because your joy is not any external thing, but it's the internal presence of the Holy Spirit that he gives you joy in spite of your circumstances, not because of your circumstances. That's why you don't need another relationship. You don't need another high. 
You don't need another this or that because you found the source of all joy and that source of all joy is the Holy Spirit of God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't need all of this because you've got all of Him. Amen. And that's what Paul was saying. I see the evidence of your election. How do you know they're saved? Saved people act different. Saved people have some. You notice a saved person. I, listen, I did that funeral last week. And I'm not picking, and you know, I love the boys. But there's a difference between saved funerals and lost funerals. There's a difference. We have sorrow, broken hearts. But we sorrow not as others have no hope. There's a joy. I'll see him again. I'll, I'll see my dear friend again. And I can live even in sorrow. I have hope. Listen, when you don't have the Lord, you have no hope. Your best moment without Christ is temporary at best. So he sees their election, evidence of their salvation, model church. And then he says, uh, <clears throat> verse number uh, six, look at it. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word of much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. I, I've already dealt with that. Let's move on. No matter the, the situation, no matter the problem, we have the joy of the Lord with us. Now look at number seven, verse number seven. So ye were in samples examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia for from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything now the the uh, I guess we number three here or so number five in my notes but they were an example because of their evangelism their example because of their example of uh, their their evangelism. So they were example to the church and they were example to the lost. First evangelism starts right here. We just saw a missionary in Thailand. I've been to Thailand. Some of you have been to Thailand. Wonderful. Evangelism doesn't start around the world. It starts at home. If you are not living the Christian life before the people that know you best, don't talk to me about what you're going to do around the world. I want to see you live at home with your brothers, your sister, your husband, your wife, your children. The people that know you best ought to know that you are a true believer in action, not word. So they were an example to the believer first. And from that, evangelism sprang. Now, we've talked a lot about this. Some of us have had some pretty long meetings here lately about uh, what the good Christians are and what good churches are. Watch this. If your local actions are not right, I could care less about your international actions. If your local testimony is right, who cares about your global testimony? It's got to be right here. But if it's right here, that will spread abroad into evangelism. Real Faith begins at home. Real faith is spread from the home outward. Sometimes we get so many, oh, so-and-so, so-and-so. Listen, so-and-so, wonderful. But how is he right here where the rubber meets the road? That's one thing that I get frustrated with about people that, that, that watch television preachers or uh, internet preachers and all that. Listen, you know what manner of life we have amongst you. Paul said, we're here every day. We labor every day. You can see us every day. You can talk to us every day. Uh, call Joel tonight and get Joel on the phone. Call Kenneth tonight and get Kenneth on the phone. You're not going to get through. Most, I'd say 95% of you have my cell phone. You text me, none, I'll text you back. Because real examples are not afraid to be real with their people and vice versa. And that spreads. So well, we're going to have a big reach one on the 25th. Wonderful. How about this? We live the Christian life tomorrow at school. We live the Christian life tomorrow at work. We live the Christian life tomorrow in our retirement community. We live the Christian life with our neighbors, our friends, and the Christian life ought to be an evangelistic effort. Everywhere you go, people ought to know who you are, so we tell them. It's an old line from an old song from Bible clubs 100 years ago. Everywhere we go, people ought to know who we are. Man, you ought to just radiate Christ. Are you a preacher? No, I'm just a Christian. I just love the Lord. I just want to 
Uh, listen, uh, the guy that uh, sold you that truck, that good story on the end of it, amen. But, but man, let the guy to Christ and sold him a truck. How'd that happen? Just talking. You're a preacher. What's the preacher do? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I was at a ball game here a few weeks ago, and the guy from Boca Ciega was here, and we were talking. He said, I'm the assistant principal at Boca Ciega. He said, uh, he said uh, my kids go to this school that y'all are playing, but uh, I drive across the bridge every day. I'm the assistant principal at Boca Ciega. And I said, oh, I used to go down to Bogey. I said, when Hasina worked there, I was able to get in for a, a teacher day or a, a, a work day, whatever they call it. I forgot the name of it, but it's a, a just what it, teaching, great American teaching. I said, yeah, they let me come in and tell them what a preacher does. And I said, it's interesting, the, the lady that was hosting me that particular day, she was a Buddhist. She was a Buddhist, the teacher was a Buddhist. And uh, so I got to tell her like three or four different classes uh, in front of her what, what I did for a living. Well, guess what I do for a living? I tell people about Jesus. Now, you may not have the same vocation I do, but you ought to be an example, and that ought to lead to evangelism. You see how those two are tied together. Years ago, some of you remember this, some of you won't. Years ago, there was a, ba- a big argument over what they called lifestyle evangelism and, and personal soul winning, or what we call maybe uh, confrontational soul winning. And uh, should you have lifestyle evangelism, or should you have confrontational uh, soul winning? And uh, this is lifestyle where you just kind of live right and do right and act like a decent person and be kind and and loving and uh, this is over here where you ask people if you die today do you know for sure you'd go to heaven and if you don't know for sure you go to heaven I'd like to take a track because I always carry a track with me and I'd like to show you what it means to put your faith and trust in Lord Jesus Christ and there was a big argument over lifestyle evangelism or confrontational evangelism let me tell you there's no argument here we ought to have both because your lifestyle ought to just easily, easily transform into talking about Jesus. So I don't know all the verses. Let me give you one verse. One verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Take one verse and what Jesus has done for you and you can talk to people about their ever-living, never-dying soul. Now watch me, if you're a scoundrel, don't talk about Jesus. Because all you'll do is be a bad witness. But boy, if you're living right and there's joy in your heart and there's a pep in your step, and man, you just kind of like old Billy Bray where every time you walk, you say amen, hallelujah, amen, hallelujah, and you just live for Christ. And then somebody says, what's going on with you? Oh, I met the Lord. And he radically changed my life. So there's an example to the believers. Number five, there's a band of the lost. Those two are one point because you ought to have both. And you say, preacher, what stirred this church? What stirred this church? Their effort, their election, their evidence, their enjoyment, their example, their evangelism. What stirred this church, verse 10? And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us, watch this phrase, from the wrath to come. Their expectation, the Lord was coming again. They lived with the second coming in view. I mentioned this morning that thing on Netflix, I saw it, preparing children to take the mark of the beast. Trying to make it cute and fun and, and accessible. And, oh, it's be great. You can buy all your stuff right in your wrist. And you can have a, your phone. That, that'll be so cool. You can just, hey, call Nick. And you walk around talking to your wrist. Hey, uh, show me this. And they'll pop up a little thing. Man, that's going to be, oh, I, I got to go. Fill, I hate filling out all those medical records. By the way, every doctor you go to now is already on an iPad, already on a computer. How easy it's going to be just to scan your wrist and have all your medical information, all your insurance information, all your homeowner's information, all your Social Security, all your drugs. Just scan my wrist. That's on the little Netflix show I told you about this morning. And I'm telling you, dear friend, the Lord is coming. You say, for the believer, what's that? Whoa, the Lord's coming. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Check it out here. You can have it all, friend. Take my house, take my car, take my mortgage. For me, the second coming is glory. 
I'm anxious. I'm like Paul, have a desire to depart, which will be far better. Man, I'd like to leave, but but I'm in a strait betwixt two because you need me here to be your preacher and uh, that my kids need a daddy and my wife needs a handsome, just devastatingly good-looking husband. And uh, so I've got to stay here and do what I'm called to do. But dear friend, there's nothing about this life that calls me anymore. I don't need one thing this world has because everything God has prepared for me is more than I could ask think, imagine, it's greater and I long to be out of this body of flesh, I long to be away from this world of sin, I long to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. I'm telling you I have no qual. you say preacher got sick and died, you ought to stand up and say hallelujah, praise God, he's a happy camper Amen. don't you worry about me dear friend, if preacher's gone, preacher's with the Lord, I have promised that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord, I'm looking forward to that trip and not afraid to go it's glory for the believer. But you better look at that last phrase. For the unbeliever, it's the wrath to come. It's a point on the man wants to die. After this, the judgment. You will give an account of every word, every deed, every action. But most of all, you will give an account for what you did with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you receive Christ, praise God, Death is glory. The second coming is glory. If you reject Christ, the second coming or death is the wrath of God to come. He pours out his wrath on those that have rejected Christ and die in their sin. So I think that motivated the church for two reasons. I'm done. And that one gentleman that texted me to hurry up, I'm done at 658. Motivated the church two reasons. Number one, I'm saved and I have a short time to work. Now the Lord could come back tomorrow, 10 years or 100 years from now, but I don't have that long because the Bible says my life is but a vapor. Here for a moment, vanish it away. Some of us are amazed that our high school reunion was 30, 40, 50, 60 years. We're amazed how quickly we have just watch life fly by us. Our sons and daughters graduated this year. For some of us, it was 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And we were teenagers graduating high school. And now we are looking at pensions and old age and all the things that come with life that is quick to pass us by. So what I'm going to do for Christ, I've got a window to do it right now. Now I'm going to say this and just hurry. This first point of the sermon, their effort uh, the Christian is happiest when the Christian is busiest serving the Lord Jesus Christ. My mom and I had lost a dear friend, more of a dear friend to my mother, uh, but a uh, precious woman went home to the Lord this week and uh, uh, buried her on Thursday. She was one of our faithful, faithful bus captains back in the day. Billy and Pat beaten ball. Just in my book, there's no finer Christian in the world than Billy and Pat and Joe and Sandy, and there's just a list of people that I grew up just, just loving them. These people go out all day Saturday, visit their boys and girls, run buses all day Sunday. I mean, work like a dog to get all those boys in there, all those girls in there, and keep them all in. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people trusted Christ, but it was a labor of love. I'm going to tell you something. These folks are now 70, 80, 90 years old, and they'll tell you the best days of my life when I was serving the Lord. Amen. When we were the busiest that was the best. That's why preachers don't retire. We just, we just reload and find something else to do because we want to stay busy. So I have a little bit of time to work. But number two, number two, the Bible says the lost man perisheth and there's no remedy. The lost man dies there's no remedy. So not only do I have a short time, but the Lord could come or the lost could die. The believer has a short time. The lost have a short time. The Lord could come back tomorrow. What are you going to do? Oh, preacher, what did the rich man say? Oh, let me run back and talk to my brothers. Too late, friend. Too late. Your time passed. And so when you live with the coming of the Lord, one way or the other we're going to meet him. He's coming for us or we're going to go to him. We're guaranteed clod or cloud. We're going to go through the dirt or through the sky one way or the other. Short time for me to get it, get it done. This week, I, I marvel, I just want to brag for a minute on our staff. You have an incredible 
school administrator, Brother, Brother Clint, Miss Grace, uh, Brother Nick, Miss Sarah, Teresa, Ryan, Tom. Man, we were the 11, 12, 13 games that we coached, hassled, man, come back, turn around, church. Listen, praise what You say, preacher, too busy, too busy. There'll come a day that I can't physically do this anymore. There'll come a day that just this, that schedule's too much for me. I need to do all I can while I can. I'm not, listen, I don't regret this week one bit. Tired, good night, are we tired? But I wouldn't regret seeing our boys and girls. Had one girl saved, by the way, over there. One of my girls got saved at the, at the meeting there, and we saw our boys and girls play well. Listen, I wouldn't trade this week. I mean, we haven't stopped since Sunday last week. Saturday, we had an event. I mean, we've had something going on all the time. You say, too busy. And sometimes we are too busy, and I understand that. And we're trying to be wise about that. But listen, I don't want to sit back and miss my opportunity to do something for God. That's why you young people, this is the time to serve the Lord, not, not wait till a better time. There is no better time than the moment you have right now. Because then you get kids and life and hurry and then your body just can't keep up and then you're gone. Number two, they don't have time. They don't have time. In the last three months, we've done a 43-year-old funeral, a 19-year-old funeral. And we'll do some senior citizens here for too long. We'll do everything from little, young to old. You say, well, I've got plenty of time. You may not have this week. I mentioned this morning, Bob Hinton, my deacon chairman that was against that building program, turned around, come on board. It wasn't just a few, few months, maybe a year or two after that. He come in on a Monday morning. Bob Hinton, you know, you know them little styrofoam, I mean, they ain't worth putting coffee in because they only about that much coffee in it. He'd only fill it up to about half. Black coffee, old Southeast Texas, center Texas. He'd come in my office Monday morning, church all day Sunday, wonderful day. Come to my office on Monday morning, drank a half cup of coffee we talked about today. He gave me his proverb, his little story, you know, and just loved him. And he left. And about two hours later, his wife called and said, get to the hospital, get to the hospital. Bobby's had a stroke. My dear deacon had a massive stroke. Talked to him that morning, loved him. Good to see you, Bobby. Went home cutting his grass. Older man cutting his grass. At heat in southeast Texas. Had a stroke. Never, never, never full. Didn't die right then, but never fully recovered. A few years later, right before I became your pastor, Bobby went on to be with the Lord. I'm going to tell you this. I hugged his neck that morning, and he's gone that afternoon with the stroke. Had a lady in my church. Uh, what was her name, Valerie? Do you remember her name? Uh, Doris Falk. Thank you, Valerie. I just have to say, Valerie, do you remember? And it comes to me because she's going to tell me in a minute anyway. Doris Falk. When I first got to the church in Texas, Doris Falk was a widow lady, and she's sitting in the back of the church, and we'd get to be singing, preaching, and she'd raise her hand, say amen, and I mean, she just said amen, raised her hand, and she comes to me one Sunday, she said, preacher, do you mind if I raise my hand and say amen? I said, oh, Doris, I said, say amen, praise the Lord, just speak English, that's all I need you to do, speak English, laughed a little bit. One Sunday, she's sitting there, I'm preaching along, and she stood up. You can tell her stomach wasn't right. She stood up, holding her stomach, walked out. Last time we ever saw her in church again, uh, we got to the doctor the next day, eat up with cancer, dead in a few days. Walked out of church, not feeling well, never saw her again in church, saw her at the hospital. Not long for that, she went to the Lord. We can tell you all those stories. Why? Because the Lord's coming, or we're going, we need to be highly motivated. The second coming of Christ... Mama, you can testify to this. I think Curtis preached on the second coming of Christ as much as any other subject that he preached on because he understood what we're going to do for the Lord we must do now while we have time. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your moments. Any of you ever, any of you have had a pricking of the Holy Spirit, give that guy a track and you didn't do it. And you went back later to try to, he works at that store, or you know there, and you went back and you couldn't find him for all the, all the money. Oh, you had that moment in time. I'm going to give you one last story. Tim's going to make over the piano. We'll have the invitation. Preacher, go by and see so-and-so. Okay, I'll go. Got busy, got busy, got busy, got busy. By the time I got around to it, too late. Now, friend, I wish I could tell you that happened once and never happened again. That's happened many times, and I'm embarrassed to tell you that. I do my best now if the Lord pricks my heart to go immediately because that may be the last prick that that person will receive 
for me to go visit, but I've got several times that I just waited too late and missed my opportunity. Now that's because of death, but one of these days the trumpet's going to sound, the dead and Christ will rise first. We which lie and remain will be caught up together and meet the Lord, so shall we ever be the Lord. And that'll be the end of this day of grace. Say, so what's the day of tribulation like? I don't understand all of it. We have glimpses of it in the New Testament. But I do know this, the day of grace as it is now where the Holy Spirit works to convict the loss of their soul uh, and bring them to Christ, that will change in that season because the Bible declares they that heard the gospel in this life will be hardened in that life. So you say, well, I'll just get saved after the rapture. I don't believe you'll be possible. I don't think it'd be possible for you to be saved. I believe you'll believe a lie because of the hardening of your heart. So I believe that you have one opportunity to be saved, and that's right now. While you have ears to hear and ability to respond. Church family, we have one opportunity to serve the Lord, that's right now. While we have the ability to do so, there will come a day that we can't, and we'll, we will rue the day that we wasted our life. This is the model church. Their evidence of salvation, their evangelism, their effort in ministry. Man, they were doing everything they could. Why? Because they thought the Lord's come back tomorrow. They, were, they didn't understand the church age. They didn't understand 2,000 years. Now, I think we as fully developed Bible believers that have an entire scripture to hold in our hand, we understand uh, the, the timeline. We understand 6,000 years. There's a lot of stuff that I look at and say, man, this makes sense to me. Now, I'm not pointing a day or time, but I'm saying there is a season that makes sense for the Lord's coming, and that season is the season you and I live in. And if Dr. Hudson was preaching that 50, 60, 70 years ago, we ought to be preaching it more today because even if it's not today, we're closer to it today than we were yesterday. Be busy. Win the lost. Get right with the Lord. Why? You don't have promise of tomorrow. You don't have promise of tomorrow. I don't have promise of tomorrow. I'll, there'll come a time. He'll sing his last song. I'll preach my last sermon. That'll be it for us. Somebody else have to step up. There'll come a time that you walk in these doors for your last service and you don't know that day and I don't know that day, but God knows that day. There'll come the last time that you say no to the Holy Ghost. That last time you say no to the Holy Ghost, you say one more time. You have no idea what your one more time is. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to give you an opportunity to pray. We're going to get ready for baptism. If I can get the Davises to come and if I can get our team to get ready, Brother Nick and others. You're here tonight. And you say, preacher, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I know the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. But the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God is speaking to my heart about my part in this great local church, about my service, my ministry, my opportunity to serve. And I'm, I'm asking God to, to search me and to try me and to show me how my part can be the most effective part. Boy, I love this morning. This morning was so precious to me. Carmel and Jen just saying, here I am, Lord, send me. I hope, I pray, I hope, I pray that some of you ladies said, hey, I can get in on that. Next week, we'll have another ministry relaunch. We're going to talk about our sports ministry. Some of you guys that love basketball and, and love boys and girls, you say, hey, I can get in on that. Next week, we're going to have our senior saint launch. The week after that, I believe. And you know, talk about getting our nursing homes. Hey, I can get in on that. Whatever it is. Now, you may be here tonight. And you don't know Christ as your Savior. You, you don't understand what it means to be born again, to, to have heaven your home, hell forever closed. You never put your faith and trust in Christ. You never ask Him to forgive you of your sin, to realize what He did on the cross. He died, He was buried, He rose again so that your sin debt could be paid. You've never done that tonight. You come and Brother Mills will be here, Brother, Brother Jim will be here, I'll be here. We'll take a Bible, we'll show you what it is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ that you might know for certain that if you died tonight or you died tomorrow or you died a hundred years from now, you know you'll go to heaven. If you are not confident that if you die today, you go to heaven, today is your day. Today may be your deadline, and you don't know what it might be your last deadline to trust Christ. We're going to stand. I'm going to pray. Tim's going to sing. They're getting our family ready for baptism. If you need to come, join Frank here at the altar. Others that have come, if you need to be saved, step out of your place. We'll meet you at the front. Father, save the lost. Help the saved to do what you've called us to do. 
We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. But Tim, you lead us as you sing.